This is information. May I help you? One moment, please. On the wire. Go ahead, please. Operator. Hello. This is long distance. May I help you? See those signals light up? Each day when you take your place at this switchboard and the signal lights come on, visualize, if you can, what lies beyond it. Beyond each glowing light. What's up, Crossing Church? How's it going? Come on, can you keep your hands together going for our Plant City campus? We see you, PC. Come on, South Shore down to Ruskin. Give them some love. And for you, you look amazing. Yeah, not you, not you. You look. Man, we're so glad. And all those watching online, man, you are tuned into the right place at the right time. This is an amazing church. How many love your church, huh? Church home? That's because we have incredible lead pastors, Pastor Greg and Tamara. We love you. We are so grateful to have you in our life. You guys do an amazing job. Well, I'm, I'm excited to be able to speak to you today. I wanted to share uh, a, a little story that I, that I heard the other day. It was, I thought it was pretty amazing. It was, it was actually, have, it had to do with uh, the Apollo missions to get the rocket, the first man on the moon. So in 1961, JFK got up before Congress and, and he made this promise. that we are going to put a man on the moon and bring him back home safely by the end of the decade. And so... They started working on it. He assigned NASA to it. But NASA was just three years old. Can you believe that? It was three years old at that point. They didn't know what they were doing and not sure they still do. But, but they, were, they were new. And so they, they, they came to Plant City and asked us if we'd help. And we said no. We were busy with berries. Uh, so they went to MIT instead. So uh, second choice. So they went to MIT and they said, hey, we need some people to help us put this rocket together. And, and so one of the people that got, got a job there working that was an MIT mathematician named Margaret. Now, Margaret Hamilton was uh, a, a brilliant lady, and she's the first one to coin the term software engineer. So at the time, software was an insignificant kind of thing. It was, it was considered inferior, an inferior science, and everything was focused on hardware. After all, you remember the, the, the pictures of old computers? They could fill an entire room. They were humongous computers. And so she was in charge of software. And as she began to work as a tedious job to get that computer to shrink down and to get the software to run, uh, to get a man to the moon, and, and, and computers really weren't that powerful. In fact, the iPhone in your pocket is a million times more computing power than the computer that took a man to the moon and back. A million times. What are you doing with your life? Like, you have a million times. Have you gone to the moon yet? Like, no. And so they were, they were doing this, a lot of work, you know, took into it. And so she would have to take her daughter to work with her because it would be long, late hours. And so one day she had her 10-year-old daughter, Lauren, with her. And as they were there, they had the flight simulator for the Apollo mission. And it was like a big computer game. It had all kind of flashing buttons and lights, and she was fascinated. And so she got on it, and as a 10-year-old, it started playing. And so she hit the uh, launch, and it started. The flight simulator started to go. And then she reached over and hit the launch button again, and the whole system crashed. Everything crashed. And so she, uh, Margaret ran in there and she said, Lauren, you got to tell me exactly what you did. Show me all the steps that happened. And so as she began to tell her, she said, I hit this button and I hit it twice. And so Margaret realizes there's a problem with the software. So the computer, because it doesn't have much power, it can only do one thing at a time. And so if you tell it to do two things, it shuts down, just like me. <laughs> My wife knows one thing, just one thing at a time. She'll get that look. I, I don't, yeah, okay, just take the trash. We'll come back and we'll get, we'll get round two, right? <laughs> one thing at a time. And so, and so, uh, so the, the, the one, one thing at a time was, was going on, and she said, I'm going to fix this. We're going to we really we'll need to solve it. And so she goes before the NASA team and, and MIT, and she explains the problem that her daughter had found. And they blew it off. They, to her dismay, they were, they were like, come on, it's no big deal. Listen, these are professional athlete, uh, professional athletes, professional astronauts, and uh, they really would have wrecked if you sent some professional athletes up there. Um, but but they, they sent these, these are professional astronauts, and, and they're not like a 10-year-old little girl. I mean, so they're not going to, they wouldn't hit the button twice. It's ridiculous. They know what they're doing. 
And so they just kind of blew her off. And so about a month later, Apollo launches, and they're, and they're just after takeoff. They're up in the air, and sure enough, that special astronaut reaches over and hits the button, and the whole thing starts to crash. Well, they were able to adjust at the last second, so they landed safely. No one, no one was injured. But an hour later, Margaret's phone rings. Hey, can you uh, start working on that software issue that we, uh, we talked about? Because they realized there was a problem with the system. They couldn't handle too many, too many instructions, too many things. And so we get fast forward a little bit. She fixes the software issue. You get to Apollo 11. Apollo 11 is literally just about to land on the moon, and all of a sudden, all of the instruments go haywire. You start seeing the warning sign pop up inside the, the capsule, and the warning sign pops up in the control room, and everyone's freaking out except Margaret because she knows that she designed the software to do its job, and she can see that it's doing its job. It was a warning, and we get that famous line that we all know, which is, Houston, we have a problem. And at that moment, she realizes there's no problem because the software has been designed for one thing. It blocks out all of the other distractions and focuses on the most important mission, which is to land safely on the moon. And so the computer realizes that the hardware malfunctioned signal. The software took control of the system and prioritized the tasks. You see, our flesh, our wisdom, our desires, our agendas, our priorities, that's all hardware. If we don't allow the software, the Holy Spirit, to speak to our priorities, then we end up crashing our life. Because there's so many, we have a tendency to, to give so much priority to the flesh, to the things of the flesh, to our day-to-day -day life. We give so much energy and priority to that when God is trying to land us right in the middle of our purpose. When we don't give the software control of the hardware in our life, we end up making the wrong things a priority in our day-to-day, -day, and we miss the very mission we were designed to accomplish. Isaiah chapter 30 tells us that your ears will hear a word behind you, and it'll say this, this is the way, walk in it. Wherever you turn, to the right or to the left. I love that. That means God has direction. God has a word. God speaks. And how many of you could use a little bit of that voice right behind your head right now? Yes. Saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Yes. And I love, I love this next verse in this, in this because it tells us what happens when we turn over our life to that voice. And it says this in 22. And you will desecrate your carved images plated with silver, your cast metal images with all the gold, and you will scatter them as a filthy thing. And you'll say to them, be gone. If you're in Plant City, you say, get on out here. <laughs> you take the things that have become gods in your life, idols in your life, the distractions of your day-to-day -day that want to dictate and run your life, because I promise you, if you do not watch it, those details will absolutely run your life. And you'll see all of those things for what they are. In light of his voice and his presence and his direction, they are simply trash. They do not hold up. So how should we respond to this voice when he speaks? Well, in 1 Samuel, it tells the story in chapter 3. 1 Samuel, I love this story because we see Samuel here. Uh, we, to give a little backstory, his mom had gone to the temple, and she had begun to pray because she couldn't have any kids. And she started to pray, God, give me a child. And, and in fact, she was praying so fervently and desperately that her mouth was moving, but, her, but no voice came out. And so Eli, the prophet, came out and was like, woman, are you drunk? Now, that's some prayer. When someone accuses you of being drunk because you're praying so hard, you know you're in prayer. All right. And so, so he said, woman, are you drunk? She says, no, you're hearing the prayers of a desperate woman. I'm desperate for God to, to open me, my womb and give me a child. And so God heard her, her cries and gave her a son. Now, she decided, I'm going to wait until he's weaned at two years old, and then I'll present him back to the temple. I'll give him back to God. Can you imagine taking your two-year-old and giving him back? If you've had a two-year-old, you can probably imagine it. 
In fact, Pastor Jonas is accepting two-year-olds now. You can just take him right to his office. He'll, don't worry, he'll take full control, he'll get them where they need to be. And so this moment occurs. And now at this point, he's been raised basically as Eli as his father. So Eli has had to parent him to develop him and raise him from a two-year-old, God bless his soul, into a now 12-year-old, which I don't know which one's worse. Okay. And so 1 Samuel chapter 3, we see this, this story play out as we, as we jump in. Now the boy Samuel was attending to the service of the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. Now you got to understand, the word of the Lord was rare not because he wasn't speaking, but because the, the perversion of the priesthood was so deep. Okay, And, and the people were so hard-hearted that they refused to listen to his voice. God is always speaking, but when we become so perverse and so distracted and so overwhelmed by the flesh that we allow it to go, there's a problem. And you got to understand that Eli's sons, while Eli was a good man, his sons were terrible. They were doing all kind of perverse stuff and, and, and breaking God's law and, and mismanaging his people and wounding those that, that had been sent to the temple. He, they were horrible people. And so Eli had to pay a price. And it wasn't because his kids were bad. You can't control that. It was because he didn't control his house. Dads. Can I stop for a second? Just grab your attention right here. You have a, a responsibility. The, the time has come for godly fathers, men who proclaim Christ as Savior, to take leadership of the spiritual life of their home. Yeah. You, 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 listen. <laughs> this doesn't mean perfect children. You're not responsible for the mistakes that they make. They will make mistakes. That is part of growing. You are responsible for ignoring the growth and development of your children. When you allow shenanigans... To go unchecked as because you're scared to deal with it, because you don't want to face it, because you're afraid of the own shenanigans in your life. We have got a responsibility, dads, and we will be held accountable, not for their actions, but for our leadership in our homes. Well, thank you, Pastor. That was very inspiring. But it happened at that time, as Eli was lying down in his place, now his eyesight had begun to be poor. And uh, I, I realized that for the first time uh, about a month or two ago, I had to go buy readers for the first time. I was so disappointed. I, was, I, w I went into to the store in the pharmacy and I put some on and I, and I turned the card around so I could read the back. And I was like, oh no, it worked. I've never been so disappointed that something worked in my life. What if we had that same desire for his voice? Like, oh, no, I recognize that life is dark. I need his voice. I need him to speak with clarity. I need him to be that voice that says, this is the way, walk in it. And, and so... The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel, that just means it was not morning yet. It was still in the middle of the night. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord uh, where the ark of God was. That The Lord called Samuel, and he said, here I am. And when he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Go back and lie down. I need my sleep, boy. Quit bothering me. <laughs> now Samuel, this is powerful. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. Listen, you have as parents we have a solemn responsibility. And that solemn responsibility is not to teach a kid how to throw a ball well. 
That solemn responsibility is not to show my daughter how to dance to a music routine. My solemn responsibility is to teach my children under my care how to hear the word of God for their life and how to apply it. How do you listen to the voice of God and how do you walk in your purpose? That is my solemn responsibility. Now, ain't nothing wrong with a baseball. Ain't nothing wrong with a dance. Listen, you, you ought to see me put on some moves. I can cut a... I, but my solemn responsibility is while I'm teaching them to throw a ball, I teach them how to hear the voice of God. While you're dancing, I ought to be able to teach you how to listen to the voice directing your steps. That is our purpose. Now, I, I do like this next verse because actually Eli does get it right. He says, for the Lord called Samuel again for the third time, and he got up, and Eli said, here I am, for you call me. And, and, and Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you that you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Can, can, can we all say that together? Say, speak, Lord. For your servant is listening. That's good. And I want you to pick up a couple things right here that are super important uh, inside this. There, there is a way that we should respond to the voice of God. There's, there's, a, there's a particular way that we are called to respond to the voice of God. And, and we see it played out in Samuel right here. Because first of all, he says to him, I want you to go lie down. In other words, I want you to intentionally slow yourself down. Slow down. You've got to take intentionality to slow down. Stop what you're doing that doesn't really matter and get alone in my presence. Slow down. Some of you need to look in the mirror and say, slow down. Like, slow down. Your, your flesh, your agenda, your life, your stuff, it's fine. It's all good stuff. It's fine. There's nothing, nothing evil about it. But if, if we're not careful, that stuff will move you at a pace faster than your ability to hear God's voice. It'll move you past the moment. It'll say, no, no, don't stop for that because you got stuff on your agenda. No, your agenda needs to wait for the voice of God. And so, so our first step is to intentionally slow ourselves down. Not only that, but we turn our expectation and our focus to the voice of God. He says, if he calls you. In other words, go back, slow down, and, and expect to hear his voice. He's going to call you again. And when he does, are you listening? You've got to turn your expectation and your focus to God's voice. Not onto your problems, not onto your situation, not onto your circumstances, not onto any of that. You, you've got to turn your, voice, your focus to his voice. And then he says, listen, and, and it shall be if he calls you that you shall say, speak. That, that means converse with me. You're asking God, please converse with me. Talk to me, Lord. Spend some time with me, God. I got to hear your voice today. When's the last time you stopped and just said, God, speak to me? I know you've heard my cries, but I want to hear yours. Speak to me. You've heard what's important to me, but, but what's important to you? Speak to me. And I like the next word, Lord. Oh, that tells you something. Because we're supposed to reaffirm who is in control in this conversation. And then he says, speak, Lord. Because if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And some of you have been claiming lordship and, and, and never submitted nothing to him. He's not in control of nothing in your life, and you're calling him Lord. You're the Lord, right? And so he, he says, so you got to remember who I am in this scenario, and you got to remember who you are. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. That means slave. You know, we, we spend a lot of times bringing our list of needs to him like we're the boss. Here, fix these things and then get back to me. Give me a report on Monday, Johnson. Right? We, we, bring, we bring him our list and like say, hey, do this stuff for me. You know it's a mess. Fix it. I mean, I know I did it, but you fix it. 
And God said, listen, I don't have a problem with taking your stuff. I got no issue. In fact, my verse, my word says, cast your cares upon me. And we love that part of the verse, cast your cares on me. But we don't like doing the second part, which is because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That means that you are yoked to his direction. So listen, when you, when you cast your cares on him, in exchange, he says, I got you. Tie yourself to me and go where I go. Listen to my voice in leading, and I'll get you out of situational living and into purposeful living because I'm headed toward purpose. That's the power of yoking with him. So we, we say, Lord, your servant is listening. And I love this because that Hebrew word for listening is not just, it doesn't mean like, hey, I'm here to, I hear things. It, it means to listen with the intent to obey. Are you listening with the intent to obey? I've, I don't know about you, I've gone before God and asked for stuff and I had no intention of obeying. In fact, I slip out before he can tell me. I'm like, here, here's my stuff. Hey, I'll catch you when it's done. And he's like, ooh, really? No intent to obey. You might see that in your kids sometimes. You know they heard you tell you to take that trash out. But no intent to obey. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Back to playing games, right? We listen with the plan, the agenda on our, on our life should be to obey. So what are some ways when, we're, when he's speaking to us, what are some ways that he talks to us? I want to give you a few right here. Um, this is not a complete list, but, but as we're going through this, my prayer is that you would recognize some of the ways that he speaks to you, and maybe you would remember some of the other ways he's tried to speak to you, but you, you maybe ignored it or, or wrote it off. And I want you to grab, grab some of these. So we'll start with one. But the, just like in the story, the first way is audible voice. An audible voice. And God, it, it, one of the powerful ways that he speaks to his children is through an audible voice. And, and now he, he did this. It wasn't as frequent. He, he did it uh, primarily. He was using his, his prophets, his kings, his priests, his leaders. He would, he would speak to them in such a way that they didn't have to question what he was talking about. The Bible gives many examples of how he spoke audibly. You know, there, there's a, in fact, in Numbers, it says uh, that now, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I will, will uh, the Lord will make myself known to him in a vision. Uh, I will speak to him in a dream. He said, but, but watch. It's not this way for my servant Moses. To Moses, he's faithful in all my household. And so in other words, he, he, I can't afford to him to get this wrong because he's in charge of a lot. And so because he's so faithful in my household, he's over so much, I speak to him directly. In other words, I speak to him, it says mouth to mouth, or that's an old way of saying face to face. I speak to him with verbal words, not with mysteries. And so the, and so the scripture, you, you may think, man, that's crazy. And, 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 and if you're hearing voices, maybe. But, but God is able to speak. And in fact, the scripture never gives us any reference to it ever ending. There's no voice that I will no longer speak out loud anymore. That, that doesn't happen. So, so because it happens so much in Scripture and, and because he didn't end it, uh, we can know that it is biblical truth and his fact is not a myth. All right. But the takeaway from that is this. Don't wait for a miraculous encounter before you start to listen to the voice of God. He's speaking in so many ways, in so many profound ways. And if you're con I know people that are like, well, you're going to have to come tell me in person. Well, that's just your hard-headed stubbornness. You need to listen to his voice in whatever way he wants to talk to you. All right, another way is scripture. That's the main way you get his voice. Every time you read the scripture, you are hearing the voice of God. When someone says, I can't hear from God, I say, you're not reading scripture. You want to hear, you, you ever get in a place where like, I can't hear, I can't hear his voice. I can't, you just read scripture. Dive into it because that is his voice. And, and, and which I think it's, it's, it's so powerful, which is why the enemy works so hard against it. It's why you fall asleep after the third sentence. Yeah, you can stay up and watch a Netflix film, a marathon of 15 shows. 
But 30 seconds into scripture, you're like, <laughs> right? Because the spirit of slumber has come upon me. I got to cast it out in the name of Jesus. He'll, he'll, he'll often uh, highlight verses or portions of, of text in the scripture, and, and they just jump out at you. That is him speaking to you. Anyone ever, ever read something, and you read it one time, it didn't mean nothing. You read it again, and suddenly it meant it like leapt off the page at you. That is God speaking through his word. Holy Spirit may give you uh, insights and stuff, and, and I want you to understand that, that God never contradicts his word, never contradicts his written word. But he will often challenge your interpretation of it. Holy Spirit may give you a fresh insight, an application as you're reading. And, and, and when God gives you this fresh insight and this new understanding, listen, it's important that it fits into the rest of the context of Scripture. And that it lines up with his character and his nature. You know, we, we hear oftentimes, we, we, as a pastor, we get people all the time like, hey, uh, I feel like God led me into this relationship, and he wants me to, he's going to use me to, to win this person I'm dating right now, you know, and, and like, like the dating field is a missions work for you. And, and, and it's like, God, God, lead me in this way. And, uh, and, and I'm like, well, well, we got a problem because his word very clearly says, do not be unequally yoked. Do not bound, bind yourself into a, that kind of relationship with someone who's not walking in your faith walk. But God going to use me to, to show him the love of Jesus. You might be called to reach them, but it won't be through dating. Why don't you share the gospel with them? Let God do his work in their life. And if it comes around to it, it comes around to it. But there is a distinct rule in the scripture, and he can't tell you not to. Then, then you go marry them, and then you come back for another meeting, and you said, well, the, the Lord wants me to get a divorce because uh, I'm actually supposed to marry somebody else, and I missed it. And... Uh, and, and, and the Lord is not happy with them, uh, neither am I. And I, I think we should get a divorce. Uh, the Lord is leading me. The Lord is calling me to, and, and I'm like, well, no, you in it now. Like, you here now. And, and, so, and so he's got another set. Now, will he restore you? Can he, can he mend when you repent of, of, of sin? Does he fix? Yeah, absolutely. Does he forgive? Yeah, 100%. But please stop calling sin and the things he clearly written about, and start, start calling that the voice of God in your life. It doesn't line up that way. Another way he speaks is through God's still small voice. We frequently underestimate the power of God's still small voice. His still small voice, his whisper in our spirit. That might come through a passing thought or a sudden impression or, or sometimes an internal sense of, of something God is saying. And we see this played out in, in Elijah's life when he was at the, at the cave and he's waiting on this big encounter. I want to hear the voice of God. And, and here comes this violent wind and it wasn't God. And here comes this earthquake. That wasn't God. This giant fire storm. It wasn't God. God showed up in this gentle whisper. Because there's an internal, there's a, a still small voice that when God speaks, he is still God speaking. And we have got to dial into it. And it's okay that you don't understand it. Can I, can I tell you that if you're, not, if you're not sure you hear God speaking and you're like, but some people seem so sure and I, I don't ever know. Can I tell you that it's okay? You're the prophet Jeremiah, a pretty, right, pretty significant guy. Do you have a book in the Bible named after you? No. Right? He, he, he's done some stuff, okay? And, and so Jeremiah is, is telling this story. He's, he says, I'm, I'm in prison, and, and I hear God say to me, your uncle's son is going to come to you, and he's going to ask you to buy his land. And he's sitting in prison. And first of all, I thought, what's a prisoner need land for? But whatever. And so he's sitting there, and then sure enough, some time passes, and in comes his uncle's son, walks right up and says, hey, listen, I think you ought to buy this property. And here's what Jeremiah says. Well, that was the word of the Lord. So in other words, he didn't know for sure. He wasn't sure that was. He just heard it. And then because anytime you hear the word of God in that still small voice, it requires patience and confirmation. 
Some of us get into a mess because we respond too quickly. We need to let God we need to marinate in his word. We need to sit on that thing and, and confirm it. Some of us hear like this voice that's calling you and, and many times we'll jump out and, and wreck our purpose for a season because we didn't, we didn't seek counsel and we didn't submit that word back to him and we didn't chase it against scripture. We didn't, we didn't spend time letting that word marinate and build in our life. And so, and so we wind up getting in trouble. So it's so important to take that still small voice and use it as a way to ask God what's going on, to, to take it deeper. Another way he speaks to us is visions and dreams. Visions uh, is when the Lord projects an image or a picture onto the screens of our minds. Visions often uh, require an interpretation. And so the Holy Spirit, if he speaks to us in visions and in dreams, when he gives us those images, it's important that we turn around to him and say, what did that mean? Let's chase you. What, I see what you said, but what do you want me to do with that? What is the, 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 the meaning behind this? And dreams happen when, when God speaks to us in our sleep. And you're like, wow, rocket science. Thanks, Pastor. And so when we're asleep, though, the reason that he speaks to us in that way and it, it, it so often is because our consciousness is turned off. And so our reason and our logic and our no and our doubt and our fear doesn't block his voice. He ain't got to fight against us to get the word to us. And uh, I, I, an interesting moment happened with me and my wife. We were uh, sleeping. God woke us up and woke her up, and, and she had uh, this dream, right, and, and then he he woke me up, and that might have been Julie. She was like, get up. <laughs> and so sometimes in a dream, you feel when you wake up that it's significant. That's one step. You know, I had a dream, and I felt it felt significant. And so I take that to the Lord. Well, he woke us up, and she began to share something that, was, uh, that God was speaking to her about our daughter. And, and I said, wait a minute. And I began to describe it, and it was the same dream she had. And, and, and I actually had a vision. I could see the entire room. And where my daughter was and what was in the room and how the room was placed. And so, I, and so we called her and said, hey, you know, what's going on? And, and here's what I saw. And this was going on. And, and these things were in the room. And this was the room you were in. And, and she said, that is exactly what was going on. And that's exactly where I was at. And, and, so, and so God, and so we knew where to pray. We knew how to direct our focus. And we began to cover her in that moment, right? Because we understood God had given us a dream. All right. Now, um, Angels is another way that God sometimes speaks to us, to angel visit, visitation. I know you, you look at me and you're like, there's, there's one. And, and, <laughs> and I don't mean to disappoint you. I, it's not. Okay. I, I'm, just, I'm just like you guys. So, so uh, angelic visitation comes. You might know the story, Luke 1, right? And the angel comes and visits Mary and says, hey, you're about to, to give birth to a, a child. And, and we know that, that these visitations come. And, and some people are like, <laughs> so I went to, to Epcot. And it was at Christmas. And Epcot had done this thing where they created these glasses that when you look at lights, you know, they're the Christmas lights at Epcot. And when you look at lights, around every light would be a bunch of angels. Because the way they designed these glasses, angels would appear around the lights. And, and so I often think, I know a bunch of people like this. That they see angels everywhere. Right? They're so focused on the angels. And, that, and I'm just here to tell you they're just messengers of a voice. And so if you see an angel, cool. If you don't see an angel, cool. What is God saying? That's the point. So don't be so distracted by the message. Uh, uh, don't miss the so focus, the source of the message. It's not about the, the delivery method. It's about the source of the message. What is God saying? So another way, another way God speaks, and this one's real big to me. He, he does this with me, and I, I bet you there's a bunch of people in the room who does it too as well. And that's creation. God speaks through his creation. Now, creation itself is, is a voice from the Lord that speaks to us in many ways, specifically in expressing uh, the truth about who God is in grand ways. And if you've never seen some sights, some, some uh, sunsets at a, at a Florida beach, you understand. You ever, anyone ever sat out before and been like, man, how can you not believe in God? And you see something like so amazing, right? You just, just, the creation is so incredible. And you look at that and, uh, and, and, and some of the Plant City, we look at a strawberry field like that. We're like, how can you not believe <laughs> that there's a God? And so, and so uh, many times we, we'll get that. But I, I know this. God 
not only gives me like wow moments of his grandeur, he actually preaches messages to me through creation. And, and I, uh, you know, like, all right, so I want to bust some people's bubbles just real quick before I get into it. Um, that cardinal that lands in your yard, that's not your grandma. <laughs> She's, she didn't. She didn't land in your yard. Like, that's not. All right. And, and the butterfly that fluttered in, that's not Aunt Susie. She's not visiting you from heaven. Like, that's not, okay. So, <laughs> it's, not, it's not happening. So, my, my, my Meemaw, uh, you, know you're, you know you're Southern, like, you got a Meemaw, right? <laughs> so, my Meemaw actually hit another person with a bat for me. So, what did your mama do? What did your Meemaw do for you, huh? Uh, we get violent up in here. All right. So, so but Meemaw was like, one of the most important people in the world when I was growing up. She, she helped raise me. Just an amazing. How many love your, your grandmas? Huh? You love your Meemaws? And so, and so Mima was just amazing. And so she had all these cardinals in her house. She had these, these, these birds everywhere, these little statues. And, and so uh, sometimes when I'm feeling down, I'm feeling sad, uh, maybe I'm feeling nostalgic or, I, or I'm missing her. It happens a couple times a year that a, a cardinal will come land on my window seal or on my back door and, and just sit there. And, and I'll feel this, like, oh, this, this presence of God, like his comfort. He's like, I got you, son. I see you. I'm here. Right? And, 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 but that's not Mimo. <laughs> How creepy. I'd be like, get out of here, Mimo. <laughs> there are cats running around. They're going to get you. You know? Like, that's... Okay, can we good with that? So Mima, you know, so I look it down like, oh, let me fly down from heaven and, and just that ain't how that works. Okay. So I, I, a few months ago, I had to go on a, a way to get away with God. Remember, remember, get alone, slow down, be with him. Okay, I had to spend some time with him. So I went to Tennessee and, and I got some alone time with him. And, and I, I hit a mountain, a trail, our first trail that I came to. And, and when I got to it, there was an old man coming down. And, and I don't know how old he was, 150. I don't know. He, was, he just looked like he was ancient. I don't know. He, he was there when the foundation of the trail was driven. I don't know. He was, he was original. Okay. He was... And so he's coming down the mountain, and, and he's the first person I see. As soon as I step on the trail, I hear his voice. He goes, he goes, watch the root. And I said, watch the root? That's, that's a weird, you couldn't say, hey, what's up, buddy? Have a good day. You started with, watch the root? Like, and who are you telling watch the root? I'm half your age. You, you're going to bust a hip. You keep walking around on these mountains like this. I was just fussing. I was agitated. I was just fussing. I don't know why. I was just fussing, right? And so I'm just, just walking on the chair, talking about me watching the root. You watch the root. I ain't even watch the root. And, and so I'm just giving it to him. And, and, and God says, I sent him. I was like, oh, it's my bad. <laughs> I thought for a second he was you because he was old, okay? <laughs> and, and God said, God, God said, son, listen. You're so focused on making the leaves look good to everyone else, you've ignored the roots. Leaves don't replenish roots. Roots build leaves. And I was like, oh, my bad. So God began to speak to me and preach that message to me as I walked. And we came to a part in the trail and I looked down, and this is what I saw. I saw this root, and it looked like the hand of God, I'll be honest with you. And I heard God say, I shape the foundations. I lay the paths. Watch the roots, because that is where life is. And so this message just oh, blew me away on this trail. And so I thought, well, this will be cute, and I'll send this to my family and my daughter, and, uh, and she'll love the heart. So I made a little heart. <laughs> right? Isn't that adorable? No, no. They, they said, Dad, that's creepy. <laughs> they, were, they were like, did you find a dead body on the trail? Like, who? <laughs> what are you doing? I was it's like, no, it's, it's the hand of God, son, daughter. Leave me alone. It's creepy. I can't, I can't win. All right. And so, and then I, a few days later, I went on another, another hike and I, I went on this trail and, and I was walking along and, and I came upon this waterfall. 
And this waterfall was amazing. And as I'm sitting there staring at it, I noticed something. And so I started to zoom in. And I'm like, man, what in the world? You see those two leaves? Can you freeze frame those two leaves for me? Okay. Um, I, I saw that. And I, and I was standing there. And I was looking. And there was leaves everywhere on the ground. They were, they were all off. There was just leaves falling out of this waterfall except for these two. And I remember I, I said, huh, ain't that funny? Why are them leaves holding on? Why ain't they falling? And I heard God speak to me again. And he said, it's not the strength of the leaf. It's its position in the rock. If you will position yourself in me, if you will hide yourself away in me, you won't have to worry about whether or not you're strong enough for the torrent of life. I will cover you. Hide yourself in me. I was like, I literally looked, I said, well, Jesus, ain't you cute with all of your little sermons? <laughs> and then he made it rain. I had to walk back in the rain and the mud. He, he didn't like that. <laughs> Am I being too real? Am I being too, like, sometimes I'm like, oh, he's just cute with all these messages. And, 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 uh, and, and so at the end of the trip, um, I, I was, uh, some locals had told me about this trail that took me up to this amazing view and, and, um, and so I, I, they took me to where the trail started. And, I, and first of all, I was like, well, that's not a trail. That's, that's where water runs out. Uh, that's, that don't look like a trail at all. It goes straight up. Like, I don't understand. They're like, no, that's the trail. And so uh, I was, I'm used to climbing Florida mountains. And <laughs> so, so the altitude was a little difficult, okay? And, uh, but I did. I, I made it up to this, this point in the mountain, and I took a picture of it. And I come back down. I showed the, the, the local that had been telling me. And, and she goes, oh, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? He said, but that's only halfway. I was like, what? Say again? I said, yeah. She goes, I'm telling you, you got to see this before you leave. And I was leaving the next morning. So I said, okay. So sun is setting. I was like, I'm going to go watch sunset from this place. I'm going to go find this magical spot that is uh, up on top of this mountain. And so I start, but the sun is going out. So I'm running of this thing. I'm, I'm really like, I'm, I'm X games. I'm just doing you know, stunts. I'm like parkour, parkour, you know, and I'm just going up this mountain. Right. And I get to the same spot I had stopped at and I started to die. I was dying on that spot, and I kept asking myself, how do they medevac off a mountain? I don't know. <laughs> how do I call? Do I make smoke signals because my phone don't work? How do I get? And, and I was like, well, this is it, Jesus. I just die right here. This is me and you. And so I'm, I'm, my heart is beating out of my chest. I can't hardly grab a breath. I am struggling. There was, when I got off that rock, there was an outline of my body. I was like, well, that's, the, that's where they laid the chalk. They know right now there's a sweat laid the markings for them. And, and, and so I'm, I'm like dying right here. And so I, I said, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to have to come back another time. And I heard God say, if you come this far, keep going. And I was like, well, you're going to have to do something about these lungs. <laughs> And just like that, my heart stopped. Well, not all the way stopped. That would be, that'd be a different problem, right? It, it slowed down. It, it settled. My breathing settled. I stopped sweating. I, I, I got my breath back, and it was like I had just started again. Brand new energy. So I said, well, if you're going to do that, I guess I'm just going to keep on going. So I went on up, found a trail, went to the top. And when I got to the top, I saw this. Just an amazing encounter. I turned on worship music and I began to have my own church service right on top of this mountain in what I could only describe as Eden. It was amazing. And listen, here's the takeaway. You've got to slow down enough to enjoy his creation and listen to the sermons that he's preaching. God is always speaking there's so many other ways, impressions, circumstances, open doors, closed doors. He speaks through all of these methods. But listen, what stops us from hearing the voice of God? My schedule is too busy or my flesh is too active. Those two things stop us from hearing him. It's not him not speaking. It's my schedule's too busy or my flesh is too active. And we have to slow down and get in a conversation and hear his voice. It's critical if we're going to land in the perfect spot of his purpose. God is always speaking. Jeremiah says, call to me and I will answer you. 
God says, listen, I'll give you great things. I'll tell you great things that you, you don't even know of yet. You don't know what you don't know, and I've got it. I can tell you, you've got to listen. Call to me, and I'll speak to you. There are hundreds of voices going on right now, music, songs, all kind of stuff playing in this room. You don't know it. You don't hear it. It's radio waves. Every radio station in our region is sh just showering you with radio waves right now. You're just being filled with, with there's, there's Christian channels sending songs. The, the, uh, there's rap channels sending songs. There's rock music being played. There's, there's God's music, which is country music, and it's coming into the room. <laughs> it's all flooding in right now, but you're not dialed into it. His voice works the same way. Life is constantly throwing you signals. Constantly throwing you things to listen to. No, no, listen to me. No, no, listen to me. You've got to listen to this. I'm your schedule. I tell you where to go. No, no, you got to listen. I'm your budget. I tell you where to go. No, no, I'm, and, you're, and all of these things are speaking to you, and you've got to take time to turn them off and go, no, no, I'm listening to this voice alone. There's one voice in my life. It's the voice of God. And so some of you right now, you recognize, I have not stopped to engage the voice of God in my life. And this is a new day for you. Today is a day where you turn on the voice of God and you watch him direct you right into the purpose he has for your life. And then some of you right now are hearing God speak to you just right in your heart going, I'm calling you to me. This is your day. This is the day you surrender to me. This is that day that I, that I restore you. This is that day that I redeem your life. This is the day. This is the call. And so I want everyone in the room, just, just join me in this prayer. Would you, would you say, repeat after me, just say, Father, I recognize that I'm a sinner in need of a savior, that I need you. I've tried it on my own and I'm just not enough. But with you, I know I can do anything. I can walk in your purpose. I don't have to waste this life. I get to walk with you. And as a result, I surrender everything to you right here. I declare you're not just Savior, but you're Lord. Everything I have is yours. My resources are yours. My life is yours. My activities are yours. My agenda is yours. I lay it all down at your feet and say, God, have your way in my life. And I thank you for coming into me giving me hope and saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed, right in this moment, as you're searching your heart, listening to the voice of God, maybe you prayed that for the first time today and you're like, you know what? I've never made him God in my life. I've never laid it down for him before. I've never surrendered everything. You know, it could be that, that you, you've, you've got an addiction. Guess what? Good news. God loves you and he wants a relationship with you. Maybe you have uh, some sin in your life, some other issue. You, you, you're, you're, you're into pornography. God loves you. God, maybe, maybe you've hurt people. God loves you, and he wants a relationship with you. Maybe, maybe it's, it's homosexuality. God loves you and wants a relationship with you. That's the answer that God is saying. That's the voice that he's sharing right now. But here's the thing. When we receive that message, there's another side to it, and it's this. When we accept that, we have to do like he did and die. We die to our agenda. We die to our plans. We die to our own will. We die to our stuff, and we surrender it to him. So if you prayed that prayer, you surrendered your life to the Lord today, maybe for the first time, or maybe you recommitted, you realize God's tugging on my heart right here at all of our campuses and online. On the count of three, I want you just to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. Just let us know. I said, that's me. I'm surrendering my life this morning. I'm surrendering my life. Thank you, God. I see your hands. Thank you. God is at work today. 
Thank you, God. Yes, Lord. If you gave your life to the Lord and someone placed a card in your hand, just fill that out and then drop it in one of the boxes or give it to somebody with an Ask Me shirt. But then if you're online, just, just message in there. Say, I surrendered my life today. Whatever it is, we want to celebrate and help you walk into your next steps with him. Okay. So I want everyone, if you would, to stand to your feet because God is about to speak in the room. And as we set an atmosphere of worship, God is about to move and speak. And uh, one of our pastors is coming out and, and, and God is going to share today some things. How, how, how many believe in God speaks? You believe God speaks? Okay. I did okay then. How many of you believe that he wants to heal and restore? How many of you believe that he has a plan right here today? He knows exactly what he wants to do. So come on, will we just surrender our hands and our worship and say, God, have your way, move in this place. We are here to listen to your voice, and we surrender to what you're saying today. Come on, let's worship together. Let's do it.